there and welcome to a brand new series right here on Wi-Fi Sheep with me, Tom. Now something I've wanted to do for quite a while has been to study and experiment with microelectronics. Now this isn't an area I'm particularly clued up on, but it's something I've had to learn when dealing with vintage computers and all the other projects that you've seen here on the channel. Now one thing I've always wanted to do is take a microprocessor out of a vintage system or get one from a spares source and wire it up manually just to try and understand how exactly it works. Well, I finally figured out how to do it and that's gonna be the beginnings of a brand new project which I'm gonna share with you here today. Now, today we're going to look at a particular microprocessor, that being the 8-bit MOS Technologies 6502. Now, this microprocessor pretty much powered 1980s computing and was found in video game systems such as the original Atari 2600 right through to the later Nintendo Entertainment System. It also powered Apple products, the Commodore 64 line, and here in the UK, the BBC Micro. And it's from this scrap BBC Micro, which I'm going to source my 6502 processor. Now, a quick word on this. This particular computer never worked properly and it has already given a lot of parts up to keep my other computers running. However, please, 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 if you want to do this project, do not go around stripping perfectly good or possibly resurrectable microcomputers, especially the vintage stock, just to get the processors out. Systems like the Commodore 64 and the NES actually had a variant of 6502, which means their pinout was actually different. If you want to find new 6502s, you can still buy brand new chipsets online. Uh, you can find stock from Western Design Center and also Rockwell do variants of the 6502 processor. And you can get those for around 10 US dollars or for about seven pounds here in the UK. So I'd strongly recommend doing that if you don't have easy access to these sort of chips. Let's start by seeing if we can actually recover the 6502 from this BBC Micro Model B. As I said in the intro, this machine doesn't actually work. And as all you can see has had bits taken from it in order to keep others going. So let's just see what's inside. So it is missing some chips, but here is the 6502 processor, which is kind of in the middle of the board, uh, middle center actually. So we should be able to just lift this chip out. Now I don't have any special tools. Sometimes you can get a chip um, lifters that grab both sides and you can pull the chip straight up. I haven't got anything like that. So what I use is a small flathead screwdriver and just try and get under the chip on both sides if you can. Just move the keyboard forward a bit, there we go. There we go. And just carefully ease the chip out. Because what you don't want to do is break the pins. There we go. And you see I've now got that processor out and all the pins are still straight. So that's been recovered. So let's see if it, A, this chip works and if we can actually do anything with it. Okay, so we've got our recovered 6502 processor. Let's just have a close look at it and see if we can identify what exactly this chip is by the numbers printed on top of it. The top four numbers here, which are 8143, well, the 81 signifies the date of manufacture. So in this case, 1981. So this is an old piece of silicon. 43 will indicate a batch number, so this is batch number 43 from that year. And then the code underneath, SY6502A. Well, the important thing here is that it's a 6502 and it's an A variant, and the SY is the manufacturer, which also ties in with this logo here. So this isn't a original MOS technology or MOS technologies 6502, but they did license out the design, so this will be a an official clone manufacturer, and it was this source of processors that Acorn sourced when they built the BBC Micros. I googled SY6502A, and I actually came up with this data sheet. Every type of uh, processor and chip usually has an accompanying data sheet from the manufacturer, and I've actually found SY stands for Sinotech or Cinetech. And this is actually the data sheet for the SY6500 series family, um, including 6502. So if we just, I haven't printed the whole document, just these two pages that I need. And you'll see here that it actually has the 6502 40 pin package. 
and it actually has the complete pinout that's for this processor and if you go that way around this is the pinout for this chip uh, interestingly it also talks about a couple of quirks of this particular variant of D6502 that aren't present in a stock chip uh, that for me is particularly interesting uh, because it does explain a few things when I was testing all this out prior to making the video but we'll come back to that a little bit later how are we going to wire up our 6502 easily and simply as possible well I want to make this video capable for many of you that like me are not electronics engineers and are not experts at this so this is kind of very much the first time of trying to put together running a microprocessor and the best way I found that we can do this without needing to do soldering or complicated heating of elements and things like that is to use what are called breadboards and I have one here these are absolutely fantastic I've seen them before but I've never really understood them until I took the plunge bought one and have been experimenting now, if you want to know where to get hold of these, a great source is our partners at PCBWay.com. So if we head to our partners at PCBWay.com, and here we are on the home page, and we click on the Shared Projects tab. And then if we click Gift Shop, you'll find that you can source most of the parts you need for prototyping and electronics projects right here from PCBWay. If we look down, you can see here's all the different modules, things they actually stock. They stock all sorts of stuff, everything you could possibly need. So let's have a quick flick through. And the prices are all really, really good. Most stuff is as, is as little as $2. So let's have a look for some breadboards, because that's what we're looking for. So it, there we go. It's come up breadboard, 300, 830 pin, solderless breadboard. And there we go, again, $2, which is an absolutely fantastic price. So there they are, that's exactly the ones I'm using today. I didn't buy mine from PCBWay, and I wish I had, because that is considerably cheaper than what I paid. And also, while we're here at PCBWay.com, I just want to show you the latest offer for PCB assembly. Currently, they're offering $30 for 20 pieces of PCB assembly, component sourcing, and online quote for 24 hour delivery. So, if you've got a design for PCB and actually want PCB Way to make the actual product for you, source the components, and actually assemble, then this is definitely for you. And again, you can get a quote and all your specifications of what exactly you need. There's a full video and there's the full information and production facilities. It's all on the site. That's PCBWay.com. So the breadboard is divided up into four separate areas and it's divided by these sort of plastic, if you like, moulds or gouges that syndicate that these areas are all different. Obviously you can see there's a plus and a minus here and a plus and a minus here. So these are your power rail voltages and these run as rows. So for example, if I put five volts there, all these holes here will be powered by five volts right down the length of the board and the same with the negative neutral or ground you may see it on circuit diagrams called ground as in gnd and again all these will be denoted here on the second row as ground the same it applies down the bottom but if you put power here there won't be any power here these four are not connected to each other unless you physically take a cable and jump the connection which is what we're going to be doing this middle area here is divided into two, and this is the breadboard area. And this is where you put most of your electrical components. And these actually run in columns. So they run down, not across. So this pin here, and all the way down to this pin here, are connected. And this pin here to this pin here are connected. But these two, unless you physically bridge something across this divide, wouldn't be connected through. So basically it's, down across the main breadboard area and it's across for the top and bottom and that's fundamentally how a breadboard works. So the very first thing we're going to do is actually seat our 6502 processor onto the breadboard and the 40 pins making sure that they are all still straight and correct will just slot into the holes in the board so we want to put this chip bridging across the divide in the breadboard area 
I want to give ourselves a little bit of room, but let's put it. If we're careful to belt there. So again, we need to be very careful with these chips to make sure we seat correctly. Okay, I had to make sure I had it in the right place. So it's important to have 20 of the pins connected this side, 20 of the pins connected on the other side, and you've got literally the ridge running underneath the chip. So that this pin here and this pin here are not connected through. Okay, let's have a look at our schematic now. And here's the diagram you can see on screen. And we need to basically apply a voltage. So like any chip, it has a positive and a negative. So let's first of all, let's find our negative, which is VSS, and that's pin 21. And 21, is this pin here. Now with breadboards, and again you can buy this from the shop on PCB Way, you can use these GPIO style pin plugs and this allows you to very quickly make a circuit. So if I plug into the ground rail here and I can just pick any one of these pins connecting up here to pin 21. and that would actually make a connection. However, if you can imagine having lots of these, let's say I just add another one randomly, let's just bridge across like that. You can begin to see that we're gonna start getting a lot of wires kind of in the way and it gets very messy. So, although these are fine to use, what I actually do is get some uh, single core wire, steel wire is the best for this, and cut it to create little bridging connectors. So I have Here's one I made up. So this is in black, so I can identify easily what is a positive and what is a negative voltage. And it's just got the twisted ends like so. And what we can do is we can then place this and that will lock in and creates zero volts. Now we need to find the plus, which is gonna be on this side of the chip. So we're gonna to have to connect onto this power rail. And it's pin eight. So we can simply count from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So we can identify it as being here. And again, I've got a little bridger. So we will connect this in onto the plus power rail here. So we've got ground over here and we've got power here. Now, I mentioned at the start of the video, these two rails aren't connected. So if I put power up here, there wouldn't be anything down here. The simplest way to do that is the bridge two at the end. So I've got two much larger connections, pieces of wire, and we can simply bridge across both sides. Okay, so We've basically got the 6502 technically powered. So if we put five volts through this circuit, it would power up the chip, but absolutely nothing is gonna happen. We've got no visual way of knowing if the chip's gonna work, and the chip actually wouldn't work if it just had voltage through it, because it has many other pins on it, and these pins need to be pulled what we call high or low, which is one or zero, and that means five volts or no volts, in order to activate or run an inbuilt function inside the microprocessor. So let's go back to our pinout and have a quick look. So we'll start at the top here and we have pin 40, which is the reset values. And this needs to be running high in order to run the chip. So what we can do is we can add a 1K resistor, just so we don't want to pull it straight high on the five volts, we want to give it a little bit of resistance. So I can simply take a 1K resistor and I'll power that onto our five volt rail to pin 40. Now if I wanted to reset this chip, I could do with adding a button that allows us to actually reset and I have here a little push reset button. It has four pins and I want to bridge it across. Actually, let's move that a little bit closer. There we go. 
So I have the button here to reset the chip. Now what I need to do is bridge a connection from this chip to the button. So you notice I left a space here and I have here a yellow cable and we're going to use yellow to denote uh, internal data. Okay, so I've got the connection from pin 40 to one side of the push button switch and then the other side of the push button switch we will simply tie to ground. So what this means is that when this button is pushed it makes a connection that means the power is pulled straight to ground and doesn't go through to the, the live or the 5 volts and that's why we need a resistor just to create a bit of a backlog so that we can pull the power straight to ground and then that's how the chip will identify if it's hit a reset. So we need to do a few other things now to make our 6502 basically do something and come alive. So we've got pin 38 which is denoted as SO on the uh, data sheet here. So we'll count back to 38, so 40, 39 we don't need to connect and 38. And 38 we want to pull permanently high for the moment so we'll connect into the top power rail into 38 so that's now connected and then we need to draw some attention down to the bottom here so we have another ground a VSS which needs to be grounded and that's pin number one so we will ground pin one pin number two which is the ready function uh, we want to always be ready so we need to set that to high Pin number four, which is IQR, we also want to permanently cable as high for the time being. So we'll put that, this is extremely fiddly as you can imagine, but we'll just put, oops, connect pin four up. And then pin six, which is NMI, we also want to pull up. Now some circuits have 1K resistors here. I'm just going to pull these straight through. I think we'll be all right. So we've obviously grounded and we've got our main voltage in there and we're pulling these high on these pins as well. One extra thing I'm going to do, and again there's some debate on some circuit diagrams if you should do this, is I'm going to add a capacitor and I'm going to put this, this is a 104 capacitor which basically comes out as 0.1 microfarads and I'm going to put this bridging the main voltage roughly where the volts go in to the chip. So I'm going to actually bridge it across the power rail here. It's not where the voltage is added, it's where the voltage goes into the chip. And the reason for this is, is this ceramic capacitor will act as a, what they call decoupler, and it will help to filter out any noise in the voltage. So the five volts we put in might not be completely clean. And of course this chip is very sensitive to drops in voltages because that's how it detects noughts and ones. So a high voltage is a one, a low voltage or nothing is a zero. And we don't want to put uh, sporadic data or upset the chip operating. So this just helps to filter out any unnecessary current. It also means if there's an interrupt, it'll um, basically charge up and act like a little battery for a couple of milliseconds and allow power to keep flowing uninterrupted to the chip. So we don't need it as such, but it's good practice to put a capacitor on the power rail. And that's just, again, bridging across the main power rail 5 volts and the ground volt. Okay then, so with this particular processor, we are just about ready to go. But what we need to do now is have some sort of output so we can see what's going on. The simplest way would be to add an LED or a light emitting diode. And so I've got this space here and I'm going to bridge an LED across here. Make sure we get this the right way around. So with an LED, there's two legs. There's a long leg and a short leg. The short leg is the negative and the long leg is a positive. So I'm going to fit my first LED with positive being this side, negative is this side. Now, if I ran five volts through this LED, it would blow up. 
so I need to add a resistor. So I've got here a 220 ohm resistor again. If you want to check out the uh, color codes, you can simply either type the code in, which is this color code, which is the band, or you can type 220 ohm resistor and Google will basically tell you which colored resistor you need. And what we're going to do is we're going to bridge into the ground from the ground of all the negative of the LED. Now on the positive side, I now want to connect up one of my address bus rails. So if we look at the schematic again, we can see that on this side of the chip, pin nine to pin 20 is AB or address bus zero to address bus 11. Now again, for internal data, we're using yellow cable, just so I can identify what's what. So let us find pin number nine. So let's just count across the pins. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, which should be there. And we're going to plug into pin nine and we'll attach pin nine to the positive side of this LED. So we now basically should have the basics of a circuit that should actually run. So we should be able to power up this process and we should get some sort of life from the LED to indicate that there's something going on. Now, as for power, I need a steady five volts in. And what I did is I took an old cheap USB hub and I stripped the USB cable off. And the USB lead is basically four cables inside. Two here that I've cut, which are you can push just see the ends of, which are a green and white, which I cut, and I'm left with a red and black, positive and negative. So what I can do is I've stripped the ends. You can either tin them with solder or you can just twist them, like I've done here, and those will create pins. And I'm going to plug. Let's say about uh, no. Let's go about here for a minute away from the chip. So I'm going to plug my red and black in and on the other end I'm going to use this mains USB adapter so any kind of uh, this is actually an iPhone or iPad charger but any kind of uh, mains USB adapter will do because it's always going to be 5 volts this side and obviously it's going to be uh, in this case UK mains which is 230 to 40 volts this side so I can then plug my cable in and then we'll plug this into the mains. Okay, so final check that everything is in the correct place and this should work. And we'll put it into the mains, see what happens. And success, we've actually got the circuit off and running and you can see here, you could probably just make it out, this LED is blinking really fast. So this chip has actually kicked into life. One thing I can do is let's just test the reset button, which you can see has an effect on the LED. It stops blinking when I hold reset down and it resets. So the 6502 is alive, we're powered up, it is running. Okay, I've just taken the power off because the blinking LED is actually upsetting the camera's autofocus, which is uh, annoying. So we'll take that off. Now, what we could do with doing is seeing what's sort of going on with the processor. Uh, it may be useful to add some more LEDs to our what we're now calling the address bus. So we've basically got 0 to 11 on the address bus here. And the address bus wraps back around the chip. And then this side, it goes from, from pin 22, just next to where we ground the chip. And it goes 12 all the way through to 15. So if you count 0 as a 1, that would actually make... An address bus of 16. So it's actually a 16 bit, each pin is a bit, 16 bit address bus on a 6502. Uh, and we'll come back to what's over here a bit later. So let's wire up, we won't do the full 16, but let's try and wire up everything we can this side. So what I'll do is I'll add some more LEDs. Now, Ideally, what you'd need to do is we'll add address bus cabling shortly to each of these. And you would really add a separate resistor to each LED. I'm going to cheat a little bit. And those who are in the Nova Electronics are going to be screaming at me right now. But we're going to take the resistor out and we'll add the resistor to ground 
the final of the red LEDs. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bridge across here, so making a circuit to go this way, till we hit this resistor. Now you could try and use pins like this again, which would work, but again it's going to create a lot of looping cable. And it's such a small piece to try and cut little bits of uh, wire to fit that it's actually a real pain. So what I found was a great solution to this was to actually use staples from a staple gun. And these work brilliantly in being able to bridge in a sort of diagonal pattern. It is very fiddly to do, but to bridge between the two pins. So, and you can see that that actually staple creates a bridge between the two negatives. Remember, everything here is negative. You can now see that I have bridged from negative here, bridges to negative here, bridges to here, to here, to here, and then finally into the resistor. So what we now need to do is basically attach additional cabling. Okay, a little while later, but we've now got the entire address bus. This is from AB0 here, which is on pin nine, to AB11 here, which is on pin 20. And you've now got this quite thick address bus here. So I've powered it all up doing the same half resistor and uh, staple trick. Uh, I've grouped them in the colours, so the red are on here, yellow is on here, and the two green are on here. So let's power up and just see what happens. And it's looking good. Let's just do a reset and see how it, if I hold on the button, it stops. And it lets go, so it's flashing, but it's flashing randomly, which means it's just what we call free running. So there's no data going into this processor. It's just outputting basically junk, complete random nonsense. So the next thing we could do is actually try and apply a piece of data. Now, bearing in mind, as far as the computers go, this is just a microprocessor. So there's no ROM and there's no RAM, there's no memory in the system at the moment and they won't be for this demonstration so what we need to do is look at hardwiring an instruction or a piece of data into this microprocessor and to do that we need to identify the data bus which can be found from pin 33 so if we count back from 40 so let's see now 40 39 38 37 36 35 34 33 so the data bus starts here and counts for eight. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So basically between where my finger is and the screwdriver is, that eight pins there is the data bus. And that's where we get the eight bit from, from being an eight bit processor. It can has a data bus of eight bits. Each of these pins equals one bit. So if we wire something in here using the ground and the five volts, we can create a 0 0.1, type scenario and actually feed a raw piece of binary into the data bus, which should change what we get on the address bus. So to do this, I'm going to pull the data through using our friend the 1K resistor and I'm going to couple each line up with a resistor in according to what I want to actually put into the chip. So we have eight 1K resistors. Okay, it doesn't really matter which way these are wired around. They're all wired the correct way here, but you can have them wired the other way and it, it doesn't make any difference. So we're starting here. Now this is pin 33, which is data bus zero. And we run from data bus zero all the way to data bus seven. Now, because we don't have any RAM, and we don't have any data input method, we have to hardwire the data in. So I've set these resistors up in a certain order. So you can see how they're connected from their corresponding pin through to either the positive or the negative power rail. If a resistor is connected to positive, that equals a one. And if a resistor like this one here is connected to the negative or the ground, that equals a zero. Now, because the way the 6502 is set out, on the top of the chip, we actually have to count backwards. So the lower number is here, the higher number is up there. So we'd actually count this data bus from here. So if we count in binary, 
the data that we've actually hardwired into the chip is as follows. It's 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. So one of the things we now need to do is to convert our binary to hexadecimal. Now, I'm not going to sit there and try and work that out by hand, not when we've got brilliant free tools online that we can use. So this is convertbinary.com, links are in the description of the video. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type our binary value of what we wired up to the 6502 in the top here. So it's 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, zero and we'll click convert and it comes back as e a so we've got our reading of e a in hex so i've got this which is the technical readout for the more modern western design center 6502 clone this is actually a nicer manual and if we just go through to where are we? the back page there's this table and if we read E and A and cross-reference it comes back to NOP and if we look up NOP on the instruction set table there we go down the bottom here NOP no operation so in other words do nothing now, this is basically the instruction set for a 6502 processor. These are all the individual commands or code instructions that you can actually put into the processor that it will understand and then can execute. And this is how you actually program a 6502. So these are all the individual instructions that are valid that it can understand. And in all, there's 70 of them on this particular processor. Now we've used the hex converter, we know that we have inputted the binary instruction for the process to basically do nothing. So it won't try and read anything and it won't output anything other than the relay instruction on the address bus. So if we power up and we hit reset and reset again, you can actually now see the diodes appear to be counting. Now, as with the data bus, the address bus, if we have power on, that's a one. If there's power off, so the light isn't on, that's a zero. So you can actually physically now see ones and zeros being counted up the address bus. The eagle-eyed amongst you may have noticed that there's something quite crucial missing from this circuit and something doesn't quite make sense as to how this circuit seems to be running but without a clock. What do I mean by that? Well, most microprocessors, including the 6502, and the Z80 need an electronic pulse, basically a clock, to make them read an instruction and basically tick forwards. They don't just run. If you power one up normally, they'll just sit statically and they won't actually execute the instruction. So this one, which is a SY6502A, has been running without a clock attached. And when I was doing the research before we started shooting this video, I was confused as to why this chip seemed to be running without a clock. I couldn't work it out until I got hold of the data sheet. And the data sheet states that SY6502 variants have an inbuilt clock. So this means that this particular processor doesn't actually have to have an external clock attached to it. Hence we plug it in and it will start to work. If I reset, it will start to work because it's using its internal clock. Now, judging by how slowly this is counting data, because we can actually see the data being counted, my guess this is probably only running at literally a few hertz, if that. It's really, really slow. Now, I'm just going to unplug again. What happens if we actually do this properly and we attach an external clock? Well, first of all, what is an external clock? How do we get one? Most clocks use what's called a crystal oscillator which is what this is and this is basically an integrated timing circuit there's four pins underneath and it has what it's rated on the front so this one is rated for one megahertz so if I put this again I have to bridge it between the positive and negative sides so if I 
put our oscillator in and it needs some power so I'll attach this pin here onto my 5 volts rail this pin in the corner is dead so it doesn't actually attach to anything this pin is ground so we'll attach that into our ground and that's actually this chip now wired up it generates a pulsing timing signal of one megahertz from this pin on this side so if we attach one of our sort of GPIO pin leads and we can attach that into the correct pin for timing on the 6502 now the timing pin is normally I think it's pin 37 so we've connected timing through to 6502 now watch what happens we plug in you'll notice that now regardless of what I do I can reset the chip but all the LEDs come on and we can't really see any progress of everything happening that's basically because one megahertz which is about the speed a Commodore 64 was clocked to is too fast for us to physically see what's going on so it's doing something but it's executing this so fast that all the LEDs appear on the minute I take the timing out quick reset you'll see it goes back to its internal clock and it starts ticking a lot slower so we can see what's going on and again if I put my timer back in as you can see it goes full so that's sort of useful if we get more advanced and further down the line and start adding things to this system we're going to need this to run faster but right now we need to be able to see what's going on I have to stress as far as I'm aware this is only a feature of this particular 6502 so if we put let's say a modern Western Design Center 6502 in I don't think it would even do anything without a clock pulse but again that's an experiment for another day so there we go we've done the very beginnings of building a computer although it's not really a computer it's more a calculating machine at the moment but at least we've got the processor outside of its original enclosure and running doing at least something so hey it's a start i really hope you enjoyed that and i hope you'll like and subscribe to us here on wi-fi sheep as we'll be doing more of these sort of tech videos in the coming months and well into next year so until then thanks so much for your company don't forget to like and subscribe and I will see you real soon right here on the channel. Until next time, bye for now.